Okay, thank you for the introduction and thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to share the work that I've been doing uh, at, in Ken Wolf's lab at University College Dublin on the regulation of mating type switching in Hensenula polymorpha. So when we think about genetic mechanisms of differentiation, our first thought is often changes at the level of gene expression. But we actually know of many examples in nature in which it's a program DNA rearrangement that is a change at the level of the genomic DNA sequence that is responsible for changes in cell type. And a classic example of this is mating type switching in yeast. So before I get to Hensenula polymorpha, I'm going to start with Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And just to briefly review the life cycle, Saccharomyces divides perfectly well mitotically, either as a haploid or a diploid, but it shows a very strong preference for the diploid state. So when you have two cells of opposite mating type A and alpha, they'll readily mate to form a diploid, and then that diploid has to encounter very specific environmental conditions to induce it to undergo meiosis and sporulation and restore the haploid state. Um, this preference for diploidy is so strong, in fact, that if a haploid cell finds itself all alone without a mating partner, then it will actually, once, after dividing once, a mother cell will switch mating type before dividing again, thus ensuring that both it and its daughter have a suitable mating partner. The mechanism for mating type switching was solved in the 1970s by Ira Herskowitz in what he called the cassette model for switching, because you have the storage of each uh, set of mating type genes at the telomeres that uh, is stored in these cassettes and then is played at the mat locus to determine mating type. So in the example I'm showing you here, we have an alpha cell. In order to switch mating types, an endonuclease called HO recognizes a specific sequence found at the mat locus, forms a double strand break, and then through homology search, um, finds the cassette of the opposite mating type genes and copies the information through synthesis-dependent strand annealing to change the mating type, so now the cell is an A. So this is a very complex system. It has many components um, and a large number of forms of regulation to ensure that it only happens when it should. Um, but we so know very little about um, where the system came from, how it originated. So we know that Saccharomyces cerevisiae and its closest relatives contain this three locus switching mechanism. But what existed before that, we had very little idea. So the work that I have been doing has focused on a clade of methylotrophic yeast uh, which are highlighted here in yellow. Um, and they're a sister clade to the CTG clade, uh, which contains candida albicans and other pathogenic yeast species. And the species I focus on particularly is Hensenula polymorpha, which is an industrially relevant strain that has, uh, is very useful for recombinant protein production. When you look at the genome of Hensenula polymorpha, and this is data that we published a couple of years ago now, um, what you'll see is that rather than having three copies of the mating type genes, it only has two. So shown here is the chromosome containing the mat, the mat genes, and it contains one copy of the alpha genes, one copy of the A genes, and they're separated by about 20 kilobases of DNA sequence. The region containing these genes is flanked by a set of inverted repeats, and the whole thing is adjacent to a centromere. And the way mating type is determined in this species is that whichever genes are closest to the centromere in a given strain, um, the proximity to the centromere represses the transcription of these genes, so you only get expression of one at a time. So in this top example, you have an alpha cell. Mating type is switched when recombination occurs between the inverted repeats that flips the entire region around, displacing the genes that are active and repressed and giving you a change in the mating type. And importantly, we found that in this genomic region, you can find genes like SLA2 and DIC1, which are also present, or it demonstrates the syntony of this uh, system with that found in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So we know that it shares a common origin with our uh, previously known three cassette system. It turns out Hensenula polymorpha is not a one-off. We've looked at other species, both within the methylotrophs, including Pichia pastoris and Pachycillin as well as an early diverging species within Saccharomycotina called Escoidia rubescens. And we have found similar two locus flip-flop mating type switching systems due to recombination between inverted repeats in all of these. And what this tells us is that this is um, an early arising uh, system that is, has a fewer components and gives us a simpler system upon which the complexity we see in Saccharomyces cerevisiae was built. So the way I like to think of it is that before yeast had cassettes, it had vinyl records. So you have A and alpha on each side, and you flip it over and play one side or the other, depending on your situation. 
So once we determined how this mechanism worked, we wanted to start understanding how it's regulated. And the first thing we wanted to know was, is it an active process or a passive one? That is, is it inducible, or does it just happen when stochastic recombination events occur in these inverted repeat sequences? So I looked for conditions that might induce this process to occur and found that nitrogen, uh, nitrogen starvation is a key signal to induce this process. So what I'm showing you here is the PCR assay that I typically use to look at mating type switching in the species. So it, here's a schematic of the chromosome in Hansenula polymorpha, and I've designed primers called labeled A, B, and C, D that flank the inverter repeat sequences, and differential amplification of these PCR primer combinations will tell you whether a specific culture is in the alpha orientation or the A orientation. And you can see that differential amplification here with the mat alpha amplification and mat A. When you grow the cells in a minimal media called NAKG, which lacks nitrogen in addition to many other nutrients, um, you see within a few hours the appearance of PCR products for the opposite mating types, which tells us that some cells in the culture have now switched. However, if you add a nitrogen source, in this case ammonium sulfate, to this culture, then you suppress this effect. So this shows that nitrogen is a key regulator of this process. So now that we know that it's active, what we're most interested in determining is what is the factor that actually induces this recombination event. We're thinking it could be some kind of endonuclease like HO that might be cleaving the mat locus to induce the recombination event. And I'll go ahead and get rid of the disappointing news in, up front and say that we have not found such a factor. Um, but in our quest to find it, we've identified some interesting things about how the transcriptional regulation of this process is occurring. And that's what I'll tell you about in my talk today. So the first thing we did was look at global changes in gene expression due to growth in different nutrient conditions. So I grew in rich media and in the NAKG media, the A and alpha haploids, as well as diploid cells. Um, so our RNA-seq analysis is summarized in the heat map shown on the left, and it's a very big data set, so I'll just give you some of the highlights. The first interesting thing we found was that when you look at A versus alpha haploid cells in any condition, the only genes that are differentially expressed are the MAT genes themselves. So in contrast to Saccharomyces cerevisiae, where you have a very distinct set of A-specific and alpha-specific genes, uh, we don't see that under these conditions in Hensenula polymorpha. As you would expect in these kind of conditions, you see a large change in gene expression in stress response genes, metabolic genes, things of that nature, but we did not see a robust mating response in this experiment. So we moved on to a different approach, and for this, we looked at a strain of Hensenula polymorpha called DL1. So DL1 is one of two primary laboratory strains of this species. The other is NSAC 495 and NSAC-495 switches beautifully when you grow it in NAKG, as you can see in the top of this figure. But DL1, no matter how long you grow it in NAKG, you never see the appearance of the opposite mating type. And we also know from the literature that it's referred to as semi-sterile. It's not a very good mater either. So there seems to be some problem with this induction of the mating response in this, in this strain. To identify what the uh, mutation was that was giving rise to this phenotype, I performed a bulk segregant analysis. So I crossed DL1 with NSAC-495, and it, I got um, one of the few diploids that was able to form from this cross, and I sporulated it and screened the haploid progeny for this ability to switch mating type. Um, and I pooled these segregants by this phenotype, uh, sequenced the genomes of the pools, mapped them back to the parental genomes, and looked for bias and segregation of the alleles based on the phenotype. And this analysis is summarized here. So here I'm showing you the chromosome of Hensenula polymorpha with all the chromosomes laid end to end on the x-axis, and on the y-axis, a metric that describes our anticipated bias in the segregation of alleles. And the strongest signal comes from chromosome 6, which contains a gene called EFG1, which is a transcription factor that's nitrogen responsive, and in candidate albicans is involved in both white opaque phenotypic switching, as well as filamentous growth. And its orthologs in Saccharomyces cerevisiae are called PHD1 and SOC2, also involved in filamentous growth. But there's no direct role for mating um, in any species that we know of for this gene. I'll also note that Hensenula does not grow filamentously, nor does it have the white opaque phenotypic switch. So um, when we looked at the genome of DL1 and NSAC495, we found that the DL1 EFG1 locus has a one base pair insertion resulting in, of course, a frame shift that results in premature tr truncation of the protein product. So it looks like EFG1 truly is non-functional in this lineage. To start looking for how this gene might be playing a role in mating, I did RNA-seq analysis for an EFG1 deletion in the NSAC-495 background, as well as an overexpression strain. 
And among the genes that are differentially expressed in these data sets, we found other genes that are involved in the white opaque phenotypic switch in candidate albicans, such as CZF1 and the war genes. We also found that RME1 is suppressed by EFG1 in, in nutrient-rich conditions. Um, and RME1 is a regulator of both meiosis and mating in yeast species. When we looked at the expression patterns for these transcription factors in that first RNA-seq data set that I showed you, the one looking at nitrogen-rich and nitrogen-poor conditions, um, we find that RME1, as you might expect for a gene with a role in mating, is, uh, has an increase in transcription when you limit nitrogen. And we found a similar expression pattern for sterile 12, which is another mating and filamentation gene in yeast species. So we decided to look more closely, not only at EFG1, but at RME1 and sterile 12 as well. So if you look at the phenotypes for the ability to switch mating types and all for deletions of any of these three genes, what you'll find is that whether you're starting out in the A orientation or the alpha orientation, if you delete any of these genes, then you get a reduction or a complete abolishment of the ability to switch mating type. We looked to see if this extended to an inability to mate as well. And similarly, when you knock out any one of these transcription factors, you lose your ability to mate. Uh, and that's what these, these plates are selectively growing for diploids. Uh, I also looked to see what the effect was of overexpression of these three transcription factors and on the ability to switch mating type and found that um, if you put them under the control of a methanol-inducible promoter, that RME1 and stay 12, sterile 12 can both uh, induce mating type switching, even in the presence of nitrogen, but EFG1 is not sufficient for this process. To look at this more closely, I did use the same constructs in, deletion in, the, in the deletion backgrounds. And what I found that's interesting here is that if you overexpress sterile 12 in the RME1 deletion background, you still are able to switch mating type, but the reciprocal is not true. When you overexpress RME1 in the state 12 deletion background, you can no longer switch mating type. So this suggests that RME1 is upstream of sterile 12. This was further supported by a ChIP-seq analysis where I found that uh, RME1 binds both to its own promoter as well as to the promoter of sterile 12. So this suggests further that RME1 is upstream of sterile 12 in this pathway. And finally, I did RNA-seq on these overexpression strains and found that when you overexpress RME1 and ster or sterile 12, that you get a very robust induction of the mating response. Um, so I'm showing here a subset of genes, many of which are involved in either mating responses or pheromone responses. Uh, the EFG1 overexpressing strain, however, does not give you this same effect and instead is uh, regulating uh, nitrogen response genes. So to summarize what we've learned about the regulation of switching in Hansenula, we know that now that mating type switching and mating seem to be co-regulated by the same set of transcription factors, and it seems to be an intersection between the canonical mating pathway and these, this differentiation pathways, particularly the wide opaque switching pathway and candidate albicans, where we have EFG1 as a regulator of RME1, which may, we hypothesize is the crux of this interaction between the differentiation and mating pathways. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge my advisor on this project, Ken Wolf, as well as the Wolf Lab Group, in particular, Kevin Byrne and Ashlyn Coughlin, who directly contributed to some of the data that I showed you today, as well as all of our collaborators and funding agencies. And I'll take any questions. Um, it does. So the processes are so tightly co-regulated, in fact, that it can be kind of hard to isolate a diploid growing vegetatively because as soon as they diploidize, they begin sporulating. So it's a, yeah, the whole process seems to be co-regulated. Yes, exactly. So the haploids kind of hang around, and then when conditions are right for the entire sexual process, that's when it makes the decision whether or not to switch mating types prior to mating. 